so ready for this treatment for freedom, and I just want to publicly state that I believe that Ken Williams being here is a demonstration of this treatment that we do every week and some of us every day. I know that we are taking a step together, so take a deep breath and we'll repeat our treatment together aloud. I speak my word for myself, my center, and all its members and friends. I know love as the only reality. I am created out of love. Love is what I am. I know this love as absolute freedom in every area of my life, the life of my center and all who call it home. I know our center's mortgages are paid in full, and I claim for all of us financial freedom with all debts paid and cleared. I release any sense of struggle or wrongdoing. I live in an abundant universe where there is more than enough for all. We experience freedom in every moment by always having more than enough money, vibrant health, and loving relationships. We are who we have come here to be. With hearts open wide, we see the world through the eyes of love. We are blessed, we are rich, and we are free. And so it is. And our five points of power. I always pay attention. I always tell the truth and tell it quickly. I always ask for what I want when I want it. I always take total responsibility for my experience, and I always keep my agreements. And so it is. John Waterhouse. Hello again. So thank you for indulging me two weeks in a row to speak to you. We like you. Yeah, thank you. I will not be with you next week. I will be in uh, Denver, Colorado. We have all of our uh, uh, newly graduated ministerial students, but they have one more thing they have to do. They have to pass their oral panels. So they're all coming to Denver, and we're going to spend a week together. And uh, those that are coming are uh, as ministerial candidates. I'm going to call a gaggle. <laughs> but once they complete their uh, their oral panels and receive their licenses. Uh, they will be what's called a convocation, which means a gathering of ministers or eagles. Yes. Not bad, huh? Yes. We do think a lot of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm excited, too, that Ken Williams is here and that we get to talk about, about these things. We will also have this afternoon uh, our center's attorney. Uh, Pete Henry will be here to, uh, to support in any way that he can. And if you're looking for an attorney, he's been really good to us. Um, so that, that's so. And that reminds me of a story of, uh, of a couple that went to their attorney. They were an elderly couple. And they went and sat down with, their, with, with an attorney. And the attorney said, what can I do for you folks today? And uh, Elmer, who was the guy, said uh, that he and Beth, his wife, uh, wanted a divorce. He said, well, how old are you? And Elmer said, well, 93. <laughs> And Bess here is 91. He said, why in the world would you, would you want to get a divorce now? He said, well, we wanted to wait until the children were dead. <laughs> All right, enough of that. Huh? I want to talk about change. Uh, and and to, to describe it, I want to give you all a little test here. We're going to start with a question. How fast are you moving right now? Doesn't look like you're moving. I would suggest that sitting in a chair, as you all are, that you're moving at zero miles per hour. Sitting in your chair. Seem reasonable? Okay, that part. But what about this? If you're sitting in a chair on a revolving planet, how fast are you moving now? 
at, at this place on the planet about a thousand miles an hour. How about that? So how about if you're sitting in a chair on a revolving planet that is orbiting the sun? How fast is that orbiting process? That's about 66,000 miles per hour. Yeah, yeah. So if you're sitting in a chair on a revolving planet that is orbiting the sun in a solar system that is orbiting a galactic core, how fast? 420,000 miles per hour. That's just the, for that last part. I'm not adding these things up. And how about if you're in a galaxy that is moving through the universe? This is what is, is estimated. 2,236,000 miles per hour, give and take a million or two. So what do we got here? Sitting in a chair, revolving planet, orbiting sun, orbiting a galactic core, moving through the universe. 2,724,000 miles an hour. Hold on! <laughs> so much for sitting still, huh? Isn't that phenomenal? Yeah. Yeah. That's happening as we speak. Almost 3 million miles an hour. We, we are catapulted through space. I don't know anything else moving that fast. But apparently the whole universe is moving that fast. I once uh, had lunch with a, uh, a physicist, a quantum physicist, and I said, if something were to be absolutely still, it would cease to exist. Isn't that correct? He said, you're absolutely right. Nothing in the universe is still. Nothing at all. And if there's no stillness, there's obviously no change. Here's another example. This represents a piece of paper. You all have seen a piece of paper, right? Okay. A piece of paper. What do you do with a piece of paper? Well, you can write a letter. You can make pretty ornaments, airplane, origami, write a document. All kinds of things to do with a piece of paper, right? What about that? Now, with the examples on the first slide, the last slide, and then this slide, some might say, Things on the last side are productive, constructive things to do with a piece of paper, and that this is a bit wasteful. I mean, it came from a tree, right? Tree died for this? And you're going to crumple it up into a ball? But if you have a cat, <laughs> this is a wonderful thing. The point I want to make is that the creative process in life is absolute. We have this thing called destruction, this concept we call destruction, but truly, Nothing is ever destroyed. Something new is created. If you burn down a building, I guess you wouldn't go to jail for this, but you're, what you're creating is a lot of gases. You're creating ash. You're creating minerals. You're creating uh, uh, metals that have been melted. All kinds of things can be created from fire of, of something that was a structure. And you go, well, you've destroyed the structure, but you've created a bunch of other things. Because life is a creative process. Everything in it is about creation. No exceptions. Everything has a creative element to it. Every thought you have has a creative element to it. It is creating something in your life. I have a colleague who, uh, who once came to an event we had in Chicago years ago. And he's always dressed impeccably when he comes to these things. But this particular day, he had on uh, jeans with a hole in the knee, uh, cowboy boots, uh, a shirt that was not tucked in, and he had a cup of coffee. And he looked at us and said, what you're thinking about me right now is creating something in your life. Mm -hmm. That's how absolute our creation is. So how do we deal with that kind of change? Well, let's just pose a, a make statement here first. The universe within, and everything within it, with everything in it, is in a constant state of change and creation. We are constantly changing things and creating them. Going back to the idea of the piece of paper. If you took a piece of paper, is it a solid, not changing thing? Of course not. It's changing constantly. It's, it's decomposing is what it's doing. It's changing from a piece of paper into something else. You can notice that very quickly if you take the piece of paper and put it out in, in the elements. For in, in a couple of weeks, it'll be gone. It'll get rained on, the sun will beat down on it, the wind will blow, and pretty soon there won't be anything there. It will have changed into things you can't see. Or you can put it in a file, and it'll last for, I don't know, a decade or two. Maybe what you've written on it won't be that clear, but it'll still be a piece of paper. You can put it into a, uh, 
into a case of, of, that, that protects it from light and from air and from temperature, and you can keep it. We don't know how long. Thousands of years. We know that we have the ability to control that, but it's still decomposing. It's still changing. Everything is changing. A piece of paper is made out of, of atomic particles that are said to be, by quantum phys physicists, to be a probability, not a real reality, just a probability. And that's true of everything in physical form. Everything in physical form is designed so that your senses can't observe it. At least the things that you can't observe are designed that way. But I've long believed that there's more going on in the universe that we can't see and can't have, in, have a relationship with with our senses than there is that we can. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about change. We're talking about how we use change. And there are ways to use change in a productive way. Most of us don't do that. Most of us are caught up in this thing about resisting change. So I want to give us uh, some looks at some of the ways these things are. Oh, here's my question. How are we relating to all this change? Yes, how are we relating to all this change? Ways that we resist change. Is anybody here, would anyone here deny that they resist change? Thank you. I didn't even want to get you caught up in that trick question. So ways that we, I want to give you four of them today. The first one is we tend to seek certainty rather than adventure. We're more comfortable if we know what's going to happen. So what we do is we create patterns in our lives that don't change. We drink the same liquids when we get up in the morning. We, uh, we wear a certain number of kinds of clothes. We are very particular about how we move through our day because doing the things we've done before creates certainty. And the idea of uncertainty is so uncertain that we prefer not to do it. So what does that do? That keeps us in the patterns of moving through life the same way we did always, and not much changes. At least it looks like not much is changing, but it is changing. Things are changing anyway. And when you try to maintain your life like that, what happens is that when something shows up that doesn't fit, we make it a problem. We immediately say, this must be wrong. You know, the way we do that, oh, this is the way we do uh, uh, adventure in our lives. We do adventure by doing something crazy, something that's impossible. This is a, a pretty bizarre picture of me walking on the fire. I had no idea why I turned translucent for that picture, but it seems to be what's happening. That fire is pretty hot, and that's a crazy thing to do. But in the midst of that, I want to tell you that it would do you all good to come tomorrow night and experience this. And I'm not asking you to come and walk on fire. I'm asking you to come and experience it. Come and see what it's like. See what it looks like when somebody walks across a blazing hot 1250 degree fire. And what that does to your reality and about how that shifts your sense of adventure because those that will walk tomorrow night will have this glorious celebration when they step off the fire. Those that have done it the first time will scream so loud with such joy that it, it will be piercing. But it will be beautiful too because they will have done something that they thought was impossible. It helps us and supports us to do things that we think are impossible. I mean, some of them are ridiculously daring, I know. At the same time, what that proves is that when, when you can step out into life, nothing can spoil your experience because you're awakening to the possibility of life. To see that really there are things that you don't know how to do that you can do. Because you will learn how to do them as you're doing them. No one can know how to walk on fire until they do. And you step out on this incredibly hot fire and walk across it, take whatever four or five steps are there, and you step off the fire, and you didn't burst into flames, and your feet didn't melt off, <clears throat> because you can do things that you didn't know you could do. This whole idea of living with a, percent, a per, part of our life as uncertain helps us live a full, rich life. Those of us that must have everything organized in a way that we are certain about what's going to happen live a very limited life and say I can't a lot, because there's a lot outside of that box that says this is what I can do. There's value in this. So again, I invite you, come tomorrow night and see what it's about. Our second way that we tend to resist is what we call the change that we want positive. 
and the change that we don't want negative. That is not accurate. Oftentimes, we go to a practitioner, or we, or we, we say affirmations, or do treatment work, and we have an image of how we'd like it to look. And what happens is it looks a little different than that. Sometimes it looks radically different than that. And we go, that's not what I wanted. That's a bad thing. Have you really looked at it? Have you really considered that this thing that showed up must be a reflection of you and your practitioner's consciousness? Is that really bad? Is it wrong? There's something to learn there. The very first treatment partner I ever had was back in Miami. My teacher was Barbara Bonacorsa. And I had, a, I had this uh, lovely young woman as my treatment partner. And I don't remember what I was treating for for her. But what I asked her to treat for for me was new clothes. Now, to tell you about this woman, she, uh, she was a, uh, a black belt in karate. And she had traveled to Japan several times to learn from the masters. She was quite influenced by uh, the Japanese culture. And during the week that we were treating, I went to the Dateland Mall, just went to the mall, went into a shop, and saw this stunning robe. And I wanted that robe. And so I bought it. And I took it home and put it on. And it wasn't until I got home that I realized I just bought a kimono. <laughs> and so, of course, I wore it to class on Monday night and explained how, how consciousness transfers in treatment work. <laughs> and it was a great story for me to realize that I was influenced in my actions by this one that I asked to hold me in consciousness and how powerful that was. It was clever. It didn't do any damage. It wasn't wrong. It was just different than I would have normally done. I kept that herb for years and really enjoyed wearing it. You know, so uh, we have this thing that we do where we, we set our intention and move into life, but it doesn't always look just like we imagine it will. But we get the result of our consciousness nonetheless. And if you sh something shows up and you say bad, wrong, no to that thing, you're denying yourself the opportunity to see what value is in there for you. There's things to do with that. It doesn't all have to look just like we say. And if it doesn't look just like we say, that doesn't make it wrong. Here's an example. The picture on the left, actually that's all one picture. The part on the left, there's a road down the middle there. The part on the left is arid land of Arizona. The part on the right is called Prescott, Arizona. <coughs> Looks a little different, doesn't it? Notice there's way more planets on the right. But the part on the left is the natural way the land is. So which one's right and which one's wrong? Is it better on the right because people can live there? Is it better on the left because that's the natural land of, of Arizona? Which one's right? Which one's wrong? It depends on what's important to you, and even naming it right or wrong doesn't, doesn't change the fact that the part on the left has its value and its purpose, and the part on the right has its value and its purpose. Neither one's right or wrong. It's the way life is, unfolding as it must. No, no positive negative there, just the way it is. Our third way we resist is we seek always to avoid challenges by attempting to control circumstances. Anyone want to deny that? <laughs> because we think if we can just get it done the way we want it, everything's going to be okay. Does everyone in your life, is, can anyone say to us today that everything has always turned out just the way you want it? No. Does that mean something went wrong? No. This is life unfolding according to our consciousness. Sometimes we're not all that aware of our consciousness. Sometimes we're, we, we think that, that things can go wrong in our life. I want to assure you nothing has ever gone wrong in your life. Your life is unfolding exactly as it must for you to be right here, right now. The same will be true a week from now, a month from now, and a year from now, and years from now. It will be the same. Your life is unfolding as it must according to your consciousness. There is no right. There is no wrong. There's simply life. 
What about all the bad things that happen in life? I assure you that the way things happen in your life to reflect into your life so that you can see and I can see what we need, I need to know what you need to know about yourself, these bigger things that are happening around the world, these, these uh, terrorist attacks, these coups, these, all these activities that are happening around the world are helping us as a species, a divine species of the divine called human beings to figure out how to live on this planet. Every single person that gives up their life in one of these events is our teacher, is asking us to see that as a people, as a, as a species on planet Earth, to see how to do this better. And frankly, I think we're learning, because statistically I will tell you that we're living in the most peaceful time in human history. We just have the most instant information system in human history, too, to tell us when something went wrong somewhere. And those that want to create those kinds of uh, calamities in life are, are preying on that system of information. Let's know better. Let's allow things to be a call to prayer, not a call to crisis. Yeah, that's the place we're going. So trying to control things is futile doesn't work that way. The only place that you can control anything is what you think and what you hold in your, deep in your, in your consciousness. Those ideas that you have thought and buried in there and somehow your subjective mind thinks that that's so. So when you have something that comes up in your life that isn't working, you've got to apply your consciousness, your awake awareness to that, to shift that thing that's going on inside of you. One of my favorite stories about that is that uh, early, uh, earlier in my life, when I was with Barbara, uh, I, I started doing this thing where I would, actually it was before we got together, I would do this thing where I would twist my ankle. I'd, I, you know, I would walk through a parking lot and there was one stone in the middle of the parking lot, and I would walk out there and step on and twist my ankle, fall on the ground, writhing in pain, have my, my ankle swell up and I'd limp around for a few days till it stopped. <laughs> it, it was chronic with me, it was happening all the time. Did I think about, about twisting my ankle? No. What I would do is I would have this momentary internal experience, and I would wince at that thought of twisting my ankle. It would just come out of nowhere. And then sure enough, there I was, on the ground again, riding. Constantly this thing would happen. So I created an affirmation, just my affirmation that worked. And that was that my ankle is strong, my ankles are healthy, my ankles support my weight easily. And I would just say that like a mantra. And it stopped. I was doing it. I was doing that in my life, creating pain through that action. It stopped. In fact, the last time that it happened was when we were building here on this property, and it had stopped before that, but we were going around here one day, and what we found was is that part of the property was supposedly in the floodplain. The corner of the last building over here was in the floodplain, and we were all anxious about that because you're not supposed to build in the floodplain. And the surveyors would come out and mark it, and it was about that much. And I'll admit to you, I never took the flag that they put in, and I moved it that far. <laughs> okay, now we're not in a floodway. <laughs> but in the midst of all that, I turned to with my ankle. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, pay attention, John, you're doing it again. We have that level of control over everything in our life. And by the way, our, our uh, uh, mortgage company is now forcing us to buy flood insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Consciousness, I'm telling you, that's how it works. So in knowing that we cannot control circumstances in every case, what we can do is be clear that everything's okay. And that's a better place to be. Sometimes we just think we're hanging on, don't we? That does not help us. The cat's in a much better state of mind. And the final one, we base our success on process rather than outcome. We think somehow that if everything that we do isn't perfectly aligned with getting us to the place we want to get, that we failed. That's not true. That's not true. Everybody thinks that success looks like that. Right? This is more realistic. <laughs> We're doing the best we know how to do in the moment, 
We're constantly correcting, we're constantly learning, and if we do that, we'll get where we want to go. If you'll notice that on the left, the arrow at the end, which we'll call the, the, the point of success, the place where we can actually claim the success, is the same in both models. It's at the same place. It's just that if, if we don't get the one on the left, that doesn't mean anything went wrong. It just means that was the path. I like to call that the shortest, circuitous path to get where we want. All right? So the question then is, how do we embrace this change? How do we go from those things that haven't worked for us to, to, and turn them into something that, have, that will work for us? The first one, instead of always seeking to a uh, certain and familiar path, let's look for something new and different to celebrate every day. I mean, that you have to do consciously. You've got to start with that. Secondly, instead of declaring anything bad or wrong in our lives, let's teach ourselves how to consciously practice not judging those circumstances. Let's live in non-judgment. Let's work at it. Yes, the judgment will come in, but then you've got to let it go. Instead of accepting anything as failure and final, let's stay open to the possibilities of our lives. There are so many opportunities and possibilities that we don't even know about. Sometimes it's easy to see and sometimes we have to be willing to interpret what we see and allow it to reveal itself within us. But we must be open for that to happen. And finally, find and acknowledge some success in your life every day. Every day something goes well. Every day something goes really well. Celebrate it. Live for it. Acknowledge it. Let it be your life. And if you do all these things, you'll get where you want to go a lot happier, a lot easier than trying to fight it. And then, of course, to remember the words of the Apostle Paul, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind every day and always. And with that, I think you might have something to work on this week. I love you very much. Thank you.